just seeing the smiles on people's faces and and seeing that the experience I'm trying to create, people are, are really accepting and loving. And we see people return constantly or telling their friends to come here. And, and never in my million years would I have thought it would have been so successful as it has been. It's really rewarding to see that people really take to the concept. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The lure of a life in hospitality has hooked many. Some at a young age, others once they step into a commercial kitchen, and some leave their chosen vocation on a whim to create a dream venue of their making. But for those that have never worked in the industry, but take a leap of faith to open their own restaurant, what are the challenges and hurdles they face? Jose Alcon is the owner of Pepitos in Marrickville, Sydney. Jose, how are you going? Good, thanks, Huck. How are you? Good. You've got a pretty fascinating story. You're not from the hospitality industry, but you opened your own restaurant during a pandemic. Yeah, against all uh, recommendations from friends in hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to always be the question. Whenever I asked anyone, I've got a lot of friends in the industry who are very successful and experienced. Their first advice was always, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems you didn't take their advice. Tell us, tell us what led to the decision to open a hospitality venue. Um, it was kind of twofold. I think um, my background, I'm, I'm from Peru, and I've always felt in Australia there was never um, the Peruvian venues that I think represent what I love about Peru. Um, you know, I always toyed with the idea of creating something to represent that love and passion that I have for my culture. And at the same time, in my neighborhood of Marrickville, you know, it's – you know, everyone thinks Maribel's a cool, cool place, um, ever evolving and changing. But I just wanted to create something different in my neighborhood as well. So that's kind of partly those two reasons that led me to do this crazy venture. So since you're not from a hospitality background, what were you doing previous to opening this restaurant? Um, yes. Yeah, so for the past two decades, I've been in film and TV as a cinematographer, uh, cameraman, director of photography. Um, yeah, very, very different. I mean, in a way, there are some similarities with regards to the team. Um, in a, on a film set, you can't create a film with one person. Same in a restaurant. You can't do it with one person either. So it's all about a, the team coming together to create an experience, you know? Take, take us to the time where you made that decision. You wanted to represent the, your cultural heritage uh, in Australia, but um, – Take us to that time of actually finding a venue and bringing it all together, given that you didn't have that sort of food background professionally. Yeah, um, it was a long project. It was an idea at first, and that kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, on every visit that I would do to Peru, I kept just going to the venues that, that I love hanging out in, which are the uh, tabernas, which are old family-run little cantinas and bars that are usually like, you know, century-old venues. Um, the atmosphere is just really, really fun, loud, super casual. And the food, you know, it's more about creating the environment and the experience of being there with friends and you could be sitting next to anyone, just bring a conversation with the person next to you. Um, so I always want to kind of create that energy here. Um, so I'm very, also very blessed to have a friend in, in Peru who's a world-class amazing chef, Diego Munoz. He, um, he lived in Australia back um, – we met when he was the head chef at Bilson's and got Bilson's the uh, three hats back. Um, so every time we'd go to Peru and hang out together, we'd always talk about, man, this is what I would love to create in, in Australia, you know, like this vibe of a taberna. You know, let's do this in Sydney, you know. I'll wait for him to come back to Australia, do his type of food in a more casual, fun environment, wait for me to – Kind of, you know, I love. I'm a creative person. I love to constantly just do creative things. So, to me, I thought it was like a transition between my cinematography and doing this would kind of work well. You know, so I'll create the environment and the space for it. We'll do your food in a really fun, casual, loud environment, and um, yeah, kind of see what happens. I mean, so we we're kind of chipping away at it. We were, you know, talking on menu ideas, um, suggestions. He kind of let a lot, a lot of it on to me just to work it out myself. Um, but then, you know, he would create his input with a lot of his amazing skills that he's got. Take us to um, what those tabernas are like. What, what sort of food uh, do you remember for eating in them and, and the sort of um, feeling that you had in them? 
gosh. I mean, you never really went there for the food because, I mean, there was always this theory. In a way, they work a little bit like, I guess, a kebab kebab shop here, you know. But you go to a taberna like sometimes late at night. You go there for some beers. You go there for a sandwich. Um, the cooking's pretty basic, home style kind of stuff. But you, you go there more for the atmosphere. You go there because it's loud, it's fun. You're having plenty of beers. You get a snack of a sandwich. Um, yeah, it's not really the food that draws you there. Obviously, you know I want to create a, that a different environment here. I want to like create the environment of being in those places, but with food that's obviously electric and just you know supercharged. The food of Peru is not known to many Australians. So take us back to your childhood. You came here when you were eight. Well, give us yeah. a sense of some of the feasts that you had with family. Uh, yes, yeah, to say I left when I was eight. So memory of Peru regarded like it's. I remember a fair bit, but it's all more glimpses and like smells or sounds. Um, you know, for, for me, growing up, food was always a family thing, you know. You cook and it's about celebrating. It's all about celebration, about being with the family, um, hanging out together. Um, yeah, like to remember the actual specifics of what we ate, it wasn't, it wasn't really that. It was more about the, the feeling that it created about being together as a family. What about it, uh, growing, up, growing up in Australia? Did you um, ex- did your family cook food from Peru, or were you sort of immersed into Australian uh, culture and food more? Well, I guess as a foreign kid in Australia, especially we grew up in um, the North Shore of Sydney, so obviously there wasn't many South Americans there, or let alone people from different cultures. You kind of want to assimilate, and you want to assimilate quickly, usually. So, like you know, Dad might be cooking stews at home but like I took home I took to school a ham and cheese sandwich every day for like I don't know for all all my school that's all I took I just made it myself and I took it because I didn't want to take you know a big stew to school Uh, I think that's a similar experience with many you know immigrants to Australia Um, so I think at the end end of the come at home like we didn't really we, we cooked it on special occasions just because Peruvian food takes a lot of time to prepare uh, there's a lot of steps involved so I was more a kid that craved pasta, pizzas, like things that weren't Peruvian. Well, you ended up opening um, in the middle of last year and many people sort of would say that there's never a good time to open a restaurant, but during a pandemic, it's probably even crazier. <laughs> T- tell us about that period of time of what it was like for someone that hadn't run a restaurant before to open during that time. Um it was tough, but it was at the same time, I think it was good. I kind of tell people in a way it perhaps was the best time to open a restaurant because I had time on my hand. Suddenly, like we were rushing to open in May. And then suddenly when we were going into lockdowns, we had this, I had the pressure of not having to open in May anymore. So it's like, oh, now I can stay closed and take my time, take it slow, make sure everything's right, and then launch when we're ready. Um, at the same time, you know, you worry about how many people you can feed, like if you can launch a full house, but then are we, like, are we ready for a full house? Like with the pandemic, we could open with a small, small amount of people in here. You know, we had, we were starting with, you know, 25 covers. So yeah, we could do that for a while until it eased and we could slowly work our menu, make sure that, you know, we could focus a customer service and every customer um, and slowly grow as the, as they allowed us to have more people in here. How have the local Marrickville community embraced Pepitos? Um, they've absolutely loved it. I think me being a local here as well, um, I kinda, I've, been, I've been here for a decade now. And to me, I love the feeling of Marrickville when I first came because it reminded me a little bit of Peru, about like the place that I like to hang out in Peru. It had this like edge, you had this griminess, had this history, had this amazing music and arts culture. So I kind of thought I was coming into this with a good understanding of the area and knowing, and knowing that what, what I was offering belongs in the area. You get a lot of things that kind of pop up in Marrickville and they're great, but you kind of go, it doesn't suit here or it doesn't feel right here. It feels like someone just plobbed it in our neighborhood while people come in here and they go, like we feel like we're overseas, but at the same time we feel like this is part of Marrickville. You know, like this has been here for a hundred years and we never knew it was here. But it feels like it's Marrickville. 
you spent the last uh, couple of decades as a cinematographer and you still continue to do that, but now you have a restaurant. Well, what, what surprised you about uh, running and owning a restaurant? Um, just time <laughs> and how much time it um, it takes. Um, yeah, I guess it's comparing it to a newborn baby. You've got to constantly, you know, you'd be feeding it you got to constantly be looking after it. I mean, it's, I guess, running your own business, it's, it's like that, but it just it doesn't stop. And as you're saying, I mean, I think generally it's like this all the time, but COVID especially, there's always a curveball thrown at you, whether it's staff shortages or it's um, stock, produce stock, or, or, you know, there's suddenly there's a lockdown and suddenly you got to try to, you know, work out how to manage everything. You're like, you can't you can't turn your back on it. You've got to constantly be on it. And I kept thinking by now to have the hang of it and just be able to, to have some sort of routine and just realize no, nah, no, nah, every week is completely different. And you're just going to got to roll with it and do the best you can with what you've got. The, the lockdown actually gave you time to think about opening the restaurant, which was a relief, but what's been the biggest hurdles for you so far and, and how are you approaching them? Um, I guess not having experience, mm, in a way, I kind of approach it differently than anyone that has worked in it would approach it. Um, it kind of, I kind of think of things different ways and think, all right, how could we go around this? That might not sometimes agree with the kitchen who's got amazing, like, you know, and they've got lots of experience and they do things differently. Like, um, as I say, I'm a creative, so I kind of work on a spur of a moment that sometimes doesn't work with a kitchen that needs to plan things. Um, so it's kind of reacting like that a bit, um, knowing like, you know, for example, public holidays are coming. Do we open? Do we close? It's like, ah, oh, well, like, let's open, see what happens. And then realizing, okay, well, maybe you shouldn't have opened because <laughs> um, everyone's playing two up at the pub. So what would they, <laughs> what would they come to a restaurant? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, I guess all these areas that, I've got no experience in it. I'm, you know, quickly trying to learn and trying to use the experience from people around me to, to learn and, you know, work around. You work with a renowned chef to um, pull something together. Can you give us an idea of uh, what people would eat at Pepito's? So here everything's been kind of reinvented to what Diego originally um, came to the table with. Obviously he works in a kitchen of, you know, 20, 20 chefs in there, um, very high-end, you know, Michelin star cuisine. So it was kind of stripping back everything to its basic ingredients. So with our chef, we've got um, Chef uh, Jeffrey Forrest. He's got decades of experience. He comes from, he's from the United States. Um, you know, he's worked in New York. He's worked at, you know, amazing venues there. So he's pretty much leaning his, you know, three, four decades of worth of experience cooking French food or cooking everything he's done, working that with the ingredients proven cuisine. So I might, you know, go with him with with a dish and say, this is the dish, this is the story about the dish, this is the ingredients of the dish. This is the way Diego has broken it down. How can we make it work in our little kitchen using your experience? And and that's and that's where the dishes shine. Like you know, people come in here and get blown away by the dishes thinking, you know, this is Peruvian food. And by all means it is, but it's not presented like Peruvian food. And, I mean, even Peruvians come here and they go, this is like the best Peruvian food I've tried in Australia. But yet it's it's not just Peruvian food. It's the chef's skills. He's coming in there cooking things more in a French style but with Peruvian ingredients. And I think that's that's the bridging gap, you know. It's all that collaboration between the two that makes people excited about our dishes here. Can you uh, tell us about one or two dishes that uh, you think star on the menu that are that sort of contemporary twist on, on some uh, classic? Yeah. Um, let me have a think. Look at the menu while I'm here. I mean, the Leche de Tigre, I mean, for once, I, I didn't want to, we didn't want to be a Peruvian restaurant. We never advertised as a Peruvian restaurant. Like we say, we're Latin American tapas to people just to broaden the scope so people don't pigeonhole us. Um, for that reason, we didn't want to have a ceviche here. I was like adamant, we're not doing ceviche. So instead what we offer here is a leche de tigre. Uh, leche de tigre is the juice that's created when you make a ceviche, it's the liquid. 
But with the lechi the tigre as a dish, it comes in a cup, so you're celebrating that juice. So it's fish cooked in lime juice as a ceviche. Then it's got uh, cooked prawns, fried calamari on top. It's just this absolutely electric dish. It's got the spice, the flavors of Peru. It's got all that, the crunchiness from the texture from the calamari as well. Um, but it's just, it's not like what people expect. Whether the touches on that that are kind of adapted, it's probably the chilies. Uh, we use some different chilies in there that you wouldn't traditionally use, but it creates, it creates that fusion, that seamless fusion that I call it that makes people think that it's Peruvian food. But, but like there's some Thai chilies in there and usually you wouldn't use Thai chilies in Peru. It's kind of using like the fresh produce that we have here in Australia to make like a version of those dishes. When you grew up in Australia, you felt like you had to assimilate uh, within the community that you're in. But as an adult, you're linking to your heritage again. Has opening the restaurant made you feel closer to your heritage? I th- yeah, totally. I think also discovering parts of my heritage I didn't know existed or looking more into it. Uh, for example, I grew up as a punk rock kid here in Sydney. Like I love punk rock, like American punk rock, Swedish, some Australian. That was really my scene. Um, with here, I wanted to you know, look into Peruvian punk rock, which has got a rich history. So all the music we play here is primarily Peruvian punk rock and then some other Spanish punk rock and Latino punk rock. Uh, But it was like looking into the history of that music. So in a way, I've learned so much about the history of music in Peru because of that. I've learned a lot about the history of different dishes because of looking at what we're offering. Um, Yeah, there's like so much that I didn't know about Peru before that I've learned from open this place and you know everyone comes in he goes oh so you've always loved this music I was like I love the music I just didn't know so much about it like from you know the, the band Los Psychos they're considered as the world's first punk rock band they came out in 64, 65 way before you know the English scene and when you hear their sound there was this like they were like a surf rock band and they had this wow. grungy destructive noise and you know going into the 80s um, underground punk scene in Peru where playing music pretty much cost you your life. Like, you know, if you got caught in a punk band, people thought you were a guerrilla terrorist and they would chuck you in jail and sometimes disappear. So, you know, it's very different. All of South America, you know, run by dictators at the time. If you were seen as other, you thought, you know, you were part of the enemy. It's a very different scene to grow up and play music compared to England or America where it's just, you know, kids on the edge or kids wanting to make some noise uh these guys were kind of playing for their life and we kind of say when people come and visit here and they might make comment about the music and say oh it's it's a bit loud or why do you have to play this music it's like well they're playing they're playing for something they're playing about something it's like the music is part of the experience here we're not background music it's all part of the dining experience like many restaurants in Australia, Pepito's is a celebration of migration. What, what do your family and the Peruvian community think of what you're doing? Um, they, well, I guess more importantly, my family, they absolutely just adore the place. Um, you know, it's not their scene regarding to the looks of it, but they absolutely love the food. They love coming here and seeing the place is full, people smiling, loving the experience coming out feeling like they they finally have that Peruvian experience here in Australia. Um, Peruvian community, it's give and take. Um, it's really hard, you know. People have an image of Peruvian cuisine, especially migrants, have an image of Peruvian cuisine as the food their grandparents made or food their parents made. And it's hard to come in here and see classic dishes served in a tapas style. You know, usually Peruvian food is really big and abundant, where you have like one dish per person. Here we're asking people to, you know, share five dishes between two people. Um, So, you know, some Peruvians are hard to kind of break um, once they see a a little plate in front of them. Uh, But once they take that first bite, they realize, wow, okay. Like it may look different, but it tastes like the most authentic Peruvian food we've ever had. Like I even asked, we do the, um, the calza, the camarones. That's usually a almost like a terrine or like a lasagna of potato, avocado, seafood, or 
other sort of protein. Uh, we kind of took that apart. With, um, with Chef, we said, let's just bring this back down to the core ingredients, which is the potato. Uh, we use prawns, uh, the avocado, and we use little dollops of um, olive aioli. So we just kind of deconstruct it a bit and have it more layered, like more modern. Peruvians come and look at it and just go, what's this? Is this like a little snack? And like I'll ask people, right, just close your eyes and just get a spoonful of it and put it in your mouth. And it just like, it just knocks them dead. They're just like, whoa, like this just takes us back to being in Lima and just trying like a beautiful calcer, you know? And like when I can break people down and just tell them to think outside the traditional mind of what Peruvian cuisine is, they completely understand it and they walk out of here just just in love with what we're doing. Marrickville has really um, risen uh, in the interest of people who love food in the last sort of five to ten years, um, particularly for Vietnamese cuisine in Sydney. Uh, tell, tell us about the community there and the food offering in Marrickville from your perspective. Yeah, um, I always tell people that diversity is probably – the, the best thing about Marrickville, when you think about, you know, the traditional owners, then to the Greek migrants and then turning to, you know, the Vietnamese community that came here as well. Like it's just all these people are still in the area. So there's this beautiful mix of cultures in here. Now also different mix of, um, of, of uh, people from different backgrounds as well, not just culturally, but also way of life, you know. Um, so I kind of thought, you know, it's a bit like, Peru as well. It's all this different mix of different cultures and history. So it, I kind of feel like Pepito suits here because there's such a history of migration of different people. You know, Marrickville primarily is now Vietnamese food. There's one Greek place, there's a Thai, a couple of Thai, but it's primarily Vietnamese. People coming here for Vietnamese and primarily cheap Vietnamese food. You know, good quality, cheap food. Um, so suddenly a little Peruvian joint popping up. Some people absolutely love it because suddenly it's something different. When we were renovating the place, people are knocking the door and go like, what are you doing? And I would joke and say, we're not doing Vietnamese. And they and they just laugh and go, well, we'll see you soon. Because, you know, as much as we love Vietnamese food in Marrickville, we also love something different. And that was partly why... If I was going to open, it was always going to be here because I knew the air is screaming for something a little bit different. There are lots of people working in hospitality that want to go out and start something of their own. What advice do you have for them? Wow. <laughs> and now I think back now what my friends told me and I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if I would tell them the same thing. Um, I think it's having a good, having a good plan. Um, as I mentioned, I picked the brains of – Every single, every single person I talked to, no matter what their background, what they did or what they work in, I picked their brains, whether it was a friends in business, I'd pick their brain, friends in hospitality, and I would ask every single person I met just their advice. Um, I, think, I think it's that. I think it's doing your homework, um, knowing, knowing where you're opening, knowing your public, um, knowing what the area wants, what the area needs, what the people are like. There's no point opening up something to suit your ego in an area that doesn't, won't accept it, you know, kind of open this knowing that, you know, I've done my work. I did, you know, a business plan, walked around the area over a year, taking notes of, of all the restaurants, the busy nights, the busy days, asking people. I did a, I did a, oh, what are they called? Um, oh, I did a survey. I did a local survey. And asking the community, like, what do you want? Well, like, what are you after? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't just, hey, man, I'm going to pop up this restaurant or this bar in this neighborhood, do what I want. It's like I kind of had the community in mind. And I think especially what thing with the pandemic's kind of shown that unless you're community-minded, like, what, what are you doing? You're just creating somewhere people to go eat, but you got to think about your community. Why is it called Pepitos? It's named after my dad. So um, in Peru and in I think also in other Spanish-speaking countries, uh, the name Jose, the nickname is Pepe. So Pepito is just an endearing endearing name for Pepe, so like little Pepe. 
so yeah, that's my dad's nickname is Pepito. So just called it after him because, you know, he's responsible for bringing us to Australia. Um, he's the one that was always in, would put into us that love of food and love of hanging out with the family and, you know, sharing, sharing experiences with food. So, you know, I had to call it after him because, you know, it's kind of celebrating him and celebrating his, his journey and his story into Australia as well. What have you loved most about the Pepito's journey so far? Um, I think just the experience people get coming in here. It's, it's truly unique to see people's smiles on, on Saturday. I, I didn't do the night service on Saturday. I hanged around a little bit and then my sister came and I just sat with her and kind of just taking it in. And just looking around and seeing people's faces and just people having a great time, just smiling, happy, like just enjoying the environment. It's it's not your – like, you know, we're asking people a lot. They're coming into this place. The, the whole menu is in Spanish. Like it's foreign to them. So they've never tried this food before. So, you know, we're asking a lot of them, you know, and to come in here with an open mind and try the food. And just be smiling, like listening, sitting here and listening to punk rock while you're having your meal. And, you know, it's, I don't know, just seeing the smiles on people's faces and, and seeing that what I'm trying to, the experience I'm trying to create, people are, you know, are really accepting and loving. And we see people return constantly or telling their friends to come here. And I'd, never in my million years would have thought it would have been so successful as it has been. And, yeah, just seeing people just... Just really, it's really rewarding to see that people really take to the concept. Does your dad love pepitos? <laughs> yeah, he does. He um, he primarily comes here every few Sundays for like a a Sunday a Sunday meal, and like oh, yeah, I've never seen him so proud in my life. It's really weird. Like uh, all my family, like we've all accomplished heaps in in all our careers, and he's completely <laughs> proud of all of us. But this is the first kind of venture that our family has done that is physical. You can actually touch and see and, and smell, you know what I mean? Like like he's proud of all the things I've done in cinematography and he's proud of my sisters and all the work they do in their work, in their careers. But it's not things you can touch and, and feel and see. Here he comes here, he sits in the corner and he sees people smiling, loving the food. Like he loves the food. Like he's the – He's the biggest judge of all the dishes. Like if he comes and he doesn't like it, like we don't do it. So like to have him be impressed with the food and be in love with what we've created, yeah, his, his face is just constantly just smiling and super proud of what we've done. Well, now you've got a taste for hospitality. Do you see yourself uh, having more than one venue? What's, and what's the plan? Uh, I think definitely um, it's definitely something I would consider – um, I think it would have to would have to be a reason for doing it, um, you know, because I've put so much of my heart and soul into this place. I can't just pop another another one in another suburb. Like it's just it's not right. Pepitos is belongs in Marrickville and nowhere else really. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of can't see it's popping up doing a Pepitos in the city. Like it just wouldn't do it. Um, other concepts perhaps to do with different types of food from Peru, definitely open to, or even a sort of takeaway option somewhere of Pepitos. Um, I think so. I think I'm definitely open to do something new. I definitely want to expand the space here and keep focusing on making this the strongest thing we can possibly do. But in the future, I definitely think we've got more things up and coming. Well, that sounds pretty exciting, Jose, and um, hats off to you for what you've pulled off during a pandemic and the celebration of your heritage as well. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. Uh, thanks, Huck. Uh, um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, heaps, mate. Talk soon. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>